Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your grace to us uh, this past weekend at our men's retreat. Uh, Father, just so much to be thankful for, so many people to honor for their work to put this together. Uh, Father, thank you for, for Pastor Jeff and his diligence to prepare uh, his message for us this past weekend. Uh, Father, in particular, I um, want to thank you for the gift of Bruce Case and all of his hours of work to not only organize this weekend's retreat for the men, but, Father, so many other weekends. Um, just hearing stories about how you've used this men's retreat for more than a decade now um, in the lives of the men of our church, and uh, we should give honor where honor is due. And so I thank you for my brother, my brother Bruce and his work to be able to, uh, to serve us. Father, as we considered the, the theme of legacy this weekend, Father, I uh, in particular ask that if we have any legacy at all as men in this church and really for our church as a whole, Father, I, I ask that our legacy would not be our, about ourselves, but that it would be only and fully about the work of your son Jesus for us and, and in us. Father, I ask that you would create in our church a, a holy ambition to leave a, a legacy not for our names, not for others to talk about us, but that they would talk about you and they would talk about your son and the work of your spirit. Father, I ask that we would decrease so that your son would increase. Father, I also pray for members in our church this morning as we open up our membership directories and we pray for members on the, uh, the 11th of February. Father, I pray for Collie Evans-Jones, for Margie Jordan, for Monique, for Jeff Kelly, for Jamie Kelly, for Kevin Kenny, for Tori Klump, for Elizabeth Kramer, for Robin Krasner, and for Nickinson before us. Father, as we open up your word in a minute and consider the uh, some difficult themes, uh, difficult themes about our sin, Father, I ask in particular for these members that you would give them special grace to repent. Father, give them a special desire, a unique desire today for holiness. Father, I ask that you would work in their hearts as we open up your word in James. Like we typically do, we not only pray for our church, but we pray for other gospel-reaching churches that we're friends with. And uh, Father, we're thankful for this new uh, friendship that we have with ACME, Association of, of Churches for uh, evangelism, uh, for missions and evangelism. Father, this morning we pray for Temple Hills Baptist Church in, in Temple Hills, Maryland. Uh, Father, in particular, I pray for my friend and, and pastor, Omar Johnson, as he opens up your word this morning in Genesis. I ask that you'd give him conviction. I ask that you would make his words clear. Father, I ask that you would be with that congregation as they hear your word, and that they would repent, and they would grow, and they would see your glory. Father, we thank you for Temple Hills Baptist Church. We ask that you would be with them as they are in the book of Genesis this morning. Father, as we turn to, to your word now in, in James chapter 4, I ask that you would be, Father, I ask that you'd be with me. I ask that I would speak only words that are in line with your word. Father, I ask that you'd be with our church where they would be discerning, that if I ever step outside of what your word is saying, I ask that they would spot it and they wouldn't listen to it. Father, wherever you're uh, whatever I speak that is in accord with your word, I ask that your spirit would produce life. Father, I ask that your spirit would produce conviction, that it would produce faith in Jesus. Father, that it would produce holiness in us. We submit all these things to you. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, we've made it a few chapters through James now, and I think it's safe to say that James has not been the easiest book, has it? <laughs> I think we can all agree about that. I mean, it's so good, but as we've been going back and forth between Luke and James, James has just 
regularly just gut punched us, hasn't it? Shown us our sin. It's definitely shown my sin. James is no joke. He's intense. I mean, if you weren't here for chapter 3, let me fill you in. Here's, here's what you missed out on. Tongues being set on fire by hell. Full of deadly poison. And controlled by demonic wisdom. This has not been light and easy stuff. And for those who know me, you know that these heavy passages are particularly hard for me to preach. Uh, this does not go in accord with my natural personality. I just want to get up here whenever I get to preach and just tell you how much Jesus loves you and how y'all are just crushing it. And Jesus does love you and y'all are crushing it, but I can't get up here and say what I want to say. You know, what's, what's my job this morning? My job is to come up underneath this book. To come up underneath this book and to relay what? The meaning of this book. And to apply that meaning to our lives. So the reality is, there's just not really a sweet way to say tongue set on fire by hell, is there? <laughs> Can't really soften that phrase up. <laughs> You don't find anyone cross-stitching tongues set on fire by hell on their pillows. <laughs> At least I hope you don't. <laughs> that would be weird. Don't do that. <laughs> all scripture is God-breathed, but not all scripture should be on pillows. But that's where we've been. That's where we've been. We've been in a, a heavy, heavy section of James. We felt convicted about our speech. But after talking with some of you, I don't get the impression that you all want to be divisive. That's not what I'm hearing from you as we've processed James chapter 3. No, I think I've seen a, a spirit of, of unity. I think I've seen a, a desire to pursue peace. I don't think any of you all woke up this morning and thought, who could I get in a fight with today? At 8.37 p.m. tonight, who can I quarrel with? I don't think any of you guys are doing that. No, I think you want peace in this church, peace in your homes, peace at your workplaces. So why did you get irritated with another member this past month? Why did you get in that argument with your spouse? What pushed you over the edge and caused you to snap at your coworker? We desire peace. I think we do. But the reality is we still have fights and quarrels among us, right? In our church, in our homes, in our work. Why? Well, that's what James wants to answer for us this morning in chapter 4. And his answer may surprise you. James is going to tell us that our interpersonal conflict is actually just a symptom of a deeper problem, a more serious problem. And he's going to tell us that it's our greed. That's the more serious problem. That's the, the deeper problem. And like a skilled physician, James is going to walk us through kind of a four-phase treatment plan for how to address our greed. He's going to address the symptoms of our greed, the diagnosis of greed, the prescription for greed, and then he'll share the prognosis or the outcome if we'll follow this treatment plan. If you haven't been to the doctor in a while and you have no idea what the words that I just said, don't freak out. <laughs> As we walk through it, I think it'll make sense. Well, let's look first at the symptoms of greed. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 4, James asks, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. 
you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. It's this classic James here, isn't it? <laughs> he doesn't dance around the issue. He doesn't stand out and you know, bounce around the peripheries of, of conflict, does he? No, he goes, he goes straight to the source of our conflict. And he makes the point that relational conflict is not our root problem. Why do we get so irritated with other people? Well, it's because they're not giving us what we want. Or they're taking away the things that we want, right? That's why we get so irritated. You see, it's not fundamentally a, a communication problem. That's not the reason, the main reason, the root reason for our conflict. Maybe part of the problem but that's not at least why I get so angry. And when, when people don't listen to you like you want, I don't think you're mostly frustrated at their bad listening skills. Why are you so angry in that moment? Well, it's pretty simple, I think. James says it's pretty simple. The reason why you get so angry at that person in that moment is not because of their poor listening skills, the reason why you get so angry is because they are standing in the way of your dissatisfaction. It, it, they're standing in the way of your satisfaction, rather. You want to be satisfied, and they, you see them as a hindrance from you being satisfied, from you fulfilling your desire, your craving to be satisfied. And so, like two starving lions on the Sahara Desert, you fight over whatever those dead antelopes are. Be that respect or comfort or sexual pleasure. Whatever it is that you are, are wanting, you fight over it, ravenous to be satisfied. Whatever you're greedily wanting. This is what explains murders. This is what explains DCF. This is what explains your argument with your spouse last night. They're all just symptoms of greed. The reason you spoke harshly with your wife is because you were wanting something from her that she wasn't providing, or at least not providing enough of. Or you were searching for that thing from other people or from other things, and you weren't getting it. That's why your blood pressure rose, and you cut her off mid-sentence. What you were wanting was in jeopardy. She wasn't doing her part in giving you that. James describes this, this wanting, this wanting language that I've been using as our passions. Do you see that in verse 1? He uses the word passions, and today, passions has a, uh, I would say, a generally positive connotation. We don't usually use the word passion today in a, in a negative way. No, I think we talk about it positively. So maybe this is confusing for you. We hear passion and we think so-and-so is a, a, a passionate leader or so-and-so brings passion to their job. We usually think about it in a positive sense. But James is using it in a, a different sense here, a, a negative sense. When James uses the word passions, he's talking about something else. He's talking about a, a greedy desire to find satisfaction apart from God. This is what sin is. Sin is basically just greedily seeking pleasure apart from God. And the harsh reality is that we are so committed to seeking pleasure apart from God, what do we do day after day after day? We did it this morning. We seek pleasure so much that we are willing to, to fight and to quarrel, just totally exhausting ourselves and other people, and we don't even ask God to give us what we want. We're just that fixated on getting pleasure apart from God that we don't even ask God for help. We're like someone I know who's married to Leah Bachelor and has three kids. He's five foot ten, or five foot nine. 
who doesn't ask for help putting together furniture even though he really needs help. <laughs> Just so determined to get what I want done that I don't want to take the time to ask for help. I'm also a little proud. <laughs> Just so determined to get what I want. I've got this tunnel vision. This is how we often search for pleasure. So controlled by our greed that we don't even think about asking God for help. And then when we do ask God for help, what do we do? We ask it to gratify our sinful passions. Verse 3. James says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. James has a very serious diagnosis for this sin-sick disease of greed. Point number two, the diagnosis of greed. Starting in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? I'll be honest with you. I was not ready for these verses this past week, as Jeff can tell you. When I started this week, I, I thought we were going to get a, a message about interpersonal conflict. A little TED Talk from James on how to resolve conflict in the church and in the home, and we'd be convicted a little bit, edified, and we'd, we'd go home, and that would be that. But then these two verses blindsided me like a Mack truck. And I realized that the, the first three verses of chapter for a really just kind of a bridge for James to address how serious our greed is. What diagnosis does James give greed in verse 4? Spiritual infidelity. He equates greed with adultery. And he's not exaggerating the point. He's not exaggerating the point for dramatic effect just to get our attention. No, he's being completely accurate with his diagnosis. Greed is adultery against God. Which makes sense when you look at verse 5. Because who made our souls? What does the text say? God. And why did God make our souls? to dwell in our souls. That's why he made your soul. God made your soul to just spend time with you. That's why he made your soul. He wanted to dwell with you. Actually, he wants this so badly that James says he yearns jealously over your soul. Not because he's insecure or emotionally unstable. <laughs> no, the triune God is doing just fine without us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfectly happy in themselves. Now, the reason why Jesus yearns jealously over your soul is because he made your soul. And he loves you. And he wants to dwell in you. That's why he's filled with holy Jealousy. It's also why he died. Jesus was jealous to make his home in your soul. Now, I have no idea why. I don't know why he wanted to make his home in my soul. <laughs> my soul was a, a complete wreck. Your soul was a complete wreck. Our souls were a complete wreck. They were all about to be foreclosed on. Termites were everywhere. The roof was falling in. Sin filled each room in our souls and deserved God's judgment in hell forever. Our souls were on the brink of condemnation. And Jesus looked at that house 
Jesus looked at our souls and he said, that's where I want to live. I want to live there. I want to live in that soul. Through the Holy Spirit, that's where I want to make my home. So here's what I'm going to do. This is what Jesus said. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to die to forgive their sins. And I'm going to marry them, Ephesians 5. And I'm going to make my home in them. I'm going to live with them forever. I'm never going to leave. I don't care how much they sin. She's my bride. This is our house. And I'm not leaving. And what have we done? What have I done in my greed? Well, we've invited other lovers into that house. Other passions. Other lovers into that house. And guys, we've even asked God to pay for these other lovers. Isn't that what verse 3 says? Asking God for things to spend it on our passions are spiritual prostitutes. And even when Jesus says no out of love for us, we still bring them into his house. And with Jesus right there watching the whole thing, we hold hands with our greed, with our sinful passions, our lovers, and commit adultery in front of his face. This is the seriousness of greed. We have sinned. We have committed adultery in the face of the living God. In his house. In the house that he died to restore so that he could dwell with us. So yes, greed is serious. And no, we can't be friends with our sinful passion. It doesn't work that way. That's what you want. If you want to be friends with God and friends with the world, it doesn't work that way. You can't be friends with God and friends of the world. That's what his enemies want. And Jesus is not interested in an open relationship. No, he wants exclusivity. He wants complete devotion, single-minded devotion to him. He wants complete intimacy from you even though he knows the greed won't stop. Even though he knows the adultery won't stop, he wants it. This has been difficult for me to get my mind wrapped around. Jesus knows that our greed won't completely stop until heaven. He knows it'll get better for a Christian. It'll get better that you will repent. But he knows that until heaven, we will continue to go after other lovers, other things, other people. And it breaks his heart. More than any spouse's heart has ever been broken. Every single time it breaks his heart. It doesn't, he doesn't get callous to it. No, it freshly breaks his heart every time we go after other things or other people for satisfaction. Look at this. Even as he watches us commit adultery again and again, what does he give us? Verse 6. He gives us more grace. He doesn't leave us. And instead, he patiently counsels, counsels us how to fight our sin and say goodbye to our old lovers. Point number three, the prescription for greed. Verse six, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. 
Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. What's the prescription for greed? What's the right response to our greedy spiritual adultery? There's only really one right response. It's humility. Humility. If you noticed in verse 6 and verse 10, this section is bookended with calls to humility. In verse 6, we see that God gives grace to the humble. In verse 10, James says to humble ourselves. James doesn't want us to miss it. He wants to make it really clear that the prescription for greed is humility. And just so he shows us, just so that we know what he means by humility, in verses 7 through 9, James describes what that humility looks like in action. You see that in verses 7, 8, and 9? James is essentially saying, you want to humbly respond to your sin? Well, then apply verses 7, 8, and 9. This is what humility looks like. It looks like submitting our whole selves to God, our whole plans, our whole families, everything to God. Verse 7. Humility looks like resisting the devil and everything opposed to God. Verse 7. It looks like drawing near to God and prioritizing intimacy with him. Verse 8. It looks like cleansing our hands and pursuing holiness. Verse 8. It looks like purifying our hearts and giving Jesus our complete devotion, verse 8. It looks like crying over our sin instead of playing it off as a big deal. There's no big deal, verse 9. James does something very interesting here. To describe humility, he really just describes repentance, right? This is what humility looks like. It just looks like verses 7 through 9, a lifestyle of repentance. Which means you can't be a humble disciple of Jesus and an unrepentant disciple of Jesus at the same time. It doesn't mix like that. You know, like like oil and water, it does not mix. If you want to humbly respond to your sin, you need to actually repent. So let's think about repentance here, how James defines it. He gives us three traits for humble repentance. Three traits. First, he says that humble repentance means mourning your sin, verse 9. And by mourning, he doesn't mean just feeling guilty about your sin. Plenty of spouses have gotten caught in adultery and have felt guilty. They may have even cried about it but then they just filed for divorce the next week. Why? What explains the tears and then the divorce? Well, it's because they actually didn't prioritize the grief of their spouse and how they offended their spouse. The tears were because they just got caught. Because they felt guilty and because they didn't like the the painful consequences for their sin. I think this is how many non-Christians feel about their sin. Just pure guilt. Nothing more. And I think one of the main reasons is because they view God as only a lawgiver. Maybe this is how you view God. As just a, a divine policeman. And if you look at God just through that prism, then I can understand why you would only think about the painful consequences of your sin, and not how you've offended God. I mean, it it makes sense to me. If God is only a lawgiver, well then who cares really about how he feels? You just don't want to get thrown in spiritual jail, right? This is all about you. But God is not only a lawgiver. He is that. But he's not only a lawgiver. He's also your loving creator. And he's made your soul to be in a relationship with him. And so when you sin, you are not just sinning against a divine police officer or a divine lawgiver. You are sinning against your loving creator who's made your soul to dwell with you, to be in relationship with you. 
who's only done good to you. That's who you are sinning against. So this should produce a, a different kind of grief. A grief that's focused more on God and less on you. A grief that's more a burden for how you've offended your loving creator and less on how bad you feel. This is especially true for Christians in the room. Members of First Point. This is especially true for us. Why? Well, because Jesus not only made your soul to dwell in, but he also died to be able to live in your soul. We believe that Jesus not only made you for relationship, but he died so that he could enter into covenant relationship with you. So that he could be your groom and you could be his bride. And so your sin is not just against a lawgiver, but against the very person who died for that sin. That will land on us. When that lands on you, when you're more concerned about how your sin breaks Jesus' heart as opposed to just your guilt, well, that's when genuine repentance really takes off. And that's what will give you the power to actually turn from your sin. Second trait of humble repentance. Humble repentance means turning from your sin. Tears are appropriate for your sin, but they are insufficient. A change needs to happen. And you know this. You guys know this. If a dog a few houses down goes to the restroom in your yard and your neighbor comes over and, and apologizes for that incident, well, the apology is nice, but you want more than that. <laughs> what do you want? You want to change. <laughs> you want that mess to be picked up. You want repentance. <laughs> Godly grief produces a change in behavior. It makes you submit to King Jesus and do whatever he tells you to do. It makes you resist the devil, wash your hands, purify your heart. Godly grief makes you cut off your hand and tear out your eye and go to the Atlantic Ocean and throw your smartphone into the ocean because you had enough of looking at illicit images. Godly grief means confessing your sin and getting biblical counseling. Godly grief means radical and probably painful changes in your behavior. Godly grief means wiping your eyes and saying, let's get to work now. Let's change. Let's turn from sin. How do you do that? It's a great ideal. How do we do that? How do we turn from our sin? Well, the third trait of repentance. Humble repentance means turning to your Savior. This is the banner over all repentance. This is what, what frames and, and fuels all of our turning from sin. It's when we look at his tearful eyes because of our sin that it produces tears in us. It's looking at him is what gives you the power to actually look away from your grief. Because if we're ever going to repent, we've got to set our eyes on Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, and how he satisfies what we're wanting from our spouse or from our friends or from our coworkers, from our job, from this church. We've got to set our eyes on Jesus if we're ever going to be able to turn from our old and other lovers. So church, let's draw near. Let's draw near to Jesus. He is so ready to draw near to us. Last point, point number four, the prognosis for humility. What's the prognosis? What's the outcome if we will humble ourselves and repent? Well, it's really, really hopeful. There's a hopeful prognosis for humility. 
If we will humble ourselves and repent of our greed, what can we expect? Verse 6. We can expect grace. You can expect grace. You can expect the presence of Jesus. You can expect forgiveness from your sin. You can expect no condemnation. You can expect Jesus to draw near to you, his very presence. But Caleb, you don't understand. You don't know how much I've turned away from Jesus. You don't know how much I've turned away. You don't know how many times. If you knew, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you'd be saying this to me. If you really knew the specific sin or sins. What about seven times? What if I turn away from Jesus seven times in that sin? Will he receive me? Will he draw near to me then? Well, I'll just let Jesus answer that question. Matthew 18, 22. Not seven times, but 70 times seven times. He will always draw near to you, no matter how much you've sinned, no matter how many times you've committed spiritual adultery. He is ready to draw near to you if you will draw near to him. You can't exhaust his grace. He always has more grace for you. Did you see that in the text? He doesn't just have grace for you. He has more grace for you. There's always more. You can't exhaust it. You sin right after this, there's more grace for you. You draw near to him, he will always draw near to you. And verse 10, he will exalt you. He will exalt you. He's going to use his grace to exalt us. You, me, all of us spiritual adulterers in this room, and that's all of us. He will exalt us if we will humble ourselves. If we will humble ourselves, God will exalt us. Like James and Hosea and Ezekiel, the the prophet Isaiah also compared our sin to spiritual adultery. In chapter 57, he paints a, a graphic picture of just how bad our spiritual infidelity is and and how much we've actually, we've worked to be unfaithful to Christ. The, the, The pain and the effort we've gone into describes it in graphic detail. But just like James chapter 5 verse 6, there's a turn in Isaiah. There's a hopeful turn and Isaiah shares how God is ready to receive the humble and the repentant adulterers. He's ready to draw near to them. He's ready to dwell with them. He wants to dwell with them. And then just a a few chapters over in in Isaiah chapter 62, Isaiah relays, not only does he want to draw near to us, not only does he want to, to be with us, he wants to delight in us. He wants to exalt us. It's worth pulling out your Bibles and turning over so you can see. It's going to be on the screen, but you want to mark this in your Bibles. Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. We're almost done here. This is God's Word. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, And your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land, Mary. For the Lord delights in you. And your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, 
so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Who's the you? Y'all. It's us. It's you. You're the bride. You, us, those filled with greedy spiritual adultery, those who have spent decades of going after spiritual prostitutes. That's who Jesus is talking about. And that's how he feels about us. He feels joy in you. He rejoices over you. His affection is full in you. And his affection is not private. No, Isaiah 62, verse 2, he wants the nations to see. He wants, to see, he wants the nations to see your righteousness, his affection for you. He wants kings to look in at First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach and to see us. Like a groom seeing his bride walk down the aisle, this is how Jesus feels about us. About you. With his righteousness covering us and his spirit working in us, his affection for us, guys, he wants it to go viral. He wants to exalt us. The spiritual adultery. His bride, who's left him over and over and over again. He wants to exalt us. And he's going to do so fully and forever one day. Revelation 19, verses 5 through 6. Y'all, he's, he's preparing a meal for us. A meal that will last forever. A meal where not only will he be exalted, a meal where he wants to actually exalt us. A meal that he's actually preparing clothes for us. Turn your head, runway clothes. Fine linen, bright and pure. Spotless. The righteous deeds of the saints. That's what he has for us. That's the clothes. That's the dress he has for us. Completely white. He wants the nations to see. He wants the nations to see our righteous deeds on display, exalted. He wants the whole world to see his bride, former adulteress, adorned in spotless, beautiful, exalted righteousness. That's what Jesus wants to do. So why not humble ourselves? That's where we're headed. Why not humble ourselves and repent? If we will, that's the future. You decide to go another way? That's not the future. If you want to continue to turn after other lovers, if that's what you want, then you will not be exalted. God says that your sin deserves judgment in hell. So while you may look exalted now, you will not look exalted then. But there's hope. There's hope for you. Won't you turn to where there's hope? Won't you decide today that you've had enough of trying to exalt yourself? Won't you today decide, I'm done exalting myself. I want to humble myself. Because if I humble myself, James just said, God's word just said, that if I draw near to God in humble repentance, he will draw near to me. Won't you do that? 
then church, won't we continue to do this over and over again today? Where is their sin? Where is their greed? Confess it. Bring it out. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Because Jesus wants to exalt you. Let's pray. Father, I ask for a, a heart of repentance, and Father, I ask for a, a heart of humility. Would we turn our, our gaze to, to Jesus? He's ready. We just heard he's ready to receive us. Would we turn to him now? In your son's name, amen.